Hello, hello. Hi, hi, welcome, welcome. My name is Peter Bell. I'm the curator of European paintings, sculpture, and drawings here at the Cincinnati Art Museum. I would like to welcome you tonight to our, our lecture. I'm really thrilled that you're here. And if you'll permit me just a few words um, before we get to the main event tonight. Um, so some of you will notice we are not in an auditorium or the auditorium. Um, and, and just to give you a little clarity on that, um, there is construction going on, below, the, the floor below us, all the way across this side of the museum. Um, and I, and I, we appreciate you bearing with us in this period, but the, the rewards will be great. So in the fall, when the construction's done and we reopen downstairs, we're going to have the Jacobs Study Center where people can make appointments to consult oh, you know, our 30,000 works on paper and other uh, objects in the collection that aren't on view. Uh, so we're really excited about that. Also, we're adding two classrooms and the Merrick Family Commons, a space that can be uh, used for meetings and will help us serve more of, uh, of the school groups that come to the museum. The auditorium will also be upgraded, right, DeMarco? There, we will have new AV in the auditorium. So this is, this is all worthwhile. Um, and so, Thank you for bearing with us. Um, so, uh, you also might be wondering about uh, the sculptures to the left and the right of me. Um, and they have a lot to do with why we're here tonight. Um, this year, the museum is functioning as something of a laboratory uh, in which we are mixing up the past and the future of sculpture to see what we can create. So we are engaging with several courses that are being taught at the University of Cincinnati's School of Art this semester to explore uh, the new forms and capacities for sculpture that Auguste Rodin's work enabled across the 20th and 21st centuries. And situating this work in a wider world of the 19th century and legacies of sculptural modernism thereafter, looking back at this material through the critical lenses of uh, post-colonialism, anti-colonialism, feminism, and other uh, theoretical and historical frameworks. The results of this laboratory experiment, as I'm thinking of it, will be on view in what I am increasingly convinced will be a beautiful and thought-provoking exhibition here at the museum this summer in the Vance Waddell and Mayerson galleries, those two galleries across from the cafe, um, just next door. Uh, this exhibition is organized by myself and by Supramarin, uh, artist curator Professor Marin Agarwal, uh, whose studio course sits at the heart of this project, and Marin is here with us uh, tonight, as along with some of her students. The exhibition, uh, entitled Rodin Response, will feature the burgers of a Calais, that, so, two of which you see here, which are kindly lent to the museum by Iris Cantor. Uh, along with works from the Cincinnati Art Museum's collection in dialogue with new sculptures that, uh, uh, sculptures by Supermarin and invited artist Laura Reeder, works made in the special 3D studio course that I mentioned. So that is sculpture of this very moment that responds to the enduring qualities and the complex legacy uh, of Rodin. So that gives you a little bit now. We are here. We are here tonight. The lecture we will hear this evening is an integral part of this project. I'm so excited. Um, we will hear landmark research and a revelatory perspective on Camille Claudel, an artist who worked closely with Rodin and whose own accomplishments were long subsumed by the older male artist's outsized legacy. Emerson Bowyer, our speaker tonight, is serial curator of painting and sculpture of Europe at the Art Institute of Chicago. He has a series of degrees from the University of Sydney and Columbia University, which is where he earned his PhD in 2015. Dr. Bowyer has held curatorial positions at a number of uh, our, our sister institutions, including the Frick Collection, the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where I was fortunate enough to have an office right down the hall from him. Uh, since 2007, Emerson has been at the Art Institute of Chicago, where right now, 
not one, but two major, sculpt major exhibitions uh, are on view uh, that were conceived by Emerson uh, with other curators. There's Canova, Sculpting in Clay, and, and the exhibition uh, Camille Claudel, which we will hear more about tonight. So with all of that in mind, would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Emerson Bogier. Uh, good evening. Uh, it's wonderful to be here um, this evening to introduce Camille Claudel, an artist who has become very close to my heart over the past five years, um, and whose current retrospective, as Peter said, is currently on view at the Art Institute of Chicago. It's the first US exhibition devoted solely to her work in over 35 years, and following its close in just under two weeks' time, sadly, it will head to the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, uh, where it will open in April. Um, I have to say, it's also quite incredible to be standing here um, on this platform flanked by Rodin's Burgers of Calais, um, whose eloquence and heroism, I'm afraid, far outstrip mine. Um, <laughs> But it's wonderful to have them here and to have this sort of physical presence that they have. And um, we'll think a little bit later on about um, the extraordinary privileging of hands um, in, in these works and indeed in Camille Claudel's work as well. Camille Claudel was a trailblazing sculptor who in the late 19th and early 20th centuries defied the social expectations of her time to pursue a powerful and expressive exploration of the human form. Largely forgotten for most of the 20th century, she was rediscovered in the 1980s um, following her confinement at the end of her life in a psychiatric institution for the final 30 years of her life. Since then, her undeniably tragic life has firmly entered the realm of popular culture. Um, her passionate relationship with Rodin and mental decline have provided rich fodder for a cottage industry in movies, plays, novels, musicals, and operatic scores. And just here you see um, just three of the sort of the best known um, retellings of Claudel's life over the past couple of decades. Um, firstly, on the left, and, and this sort of um, towering film from 1988, Bruno Neuten's Camille Claudel, um, which starred the great Isabella Diani um, as Claudel and Gerard Depardieu as Rodin. You can only imagine if you haven't seen it. Um, it is a sweeping, bodice-ripping drama. Um, <laughs> And, and in the center, you see a more recent film, um, Camille Claudel 1915, uh, which deals with one year in the life of Claudel in the psychiatric institution, um, starring the great Juliette Binoche. And then on the right, um, uh, from, uh, from 2012, um, the great opera composer Jake Heggie's Camille Claudel song cycle, which was written for um, the world-renowned mezzo-soprano Joyce Di Donato, and which I can't help but show this, and which she performed in the galleries of our exhibition just about two or three weeks ago. And I have to say, it was one of the more extraordinary um, moments of my life with everybody involved in tears at the end. Um, and, and, and I love the way here that, that, that Joyce is, um, her own bodily movements are, you know, uh, in a way, you know, repeating or riffing on Claudel's own statuary and indeed um, Pierre de Vicente that you'll see in, <laughs> in the gallery just behind you by Rodin. Um, now, despite the increased awareness of the artists um, that many of the endeavors currently around Claudel have achieved, they've often spun sensationalist and melodramatic tales of doomed romance, victimhood, and madness. This biographical miasma has tended to obscure or even excise the sculptor's art and agency. But she was an extraordinary artist whom the French critic Octave Mirbeau memorably described as something unique, a revolt of nature, a woman genius. 
brimming with both praise and condescension, this exclamation by Mirbeau encapsulates the position of Claudel in the art world at the end of the 19th century, of her sex, but radically divergent from its conventional social construction, she was a new and unsettling figure. Genius had always been positioned as the exclusive preserve of men, and yet here was a woman who exhibited all the traditional qualities of artistic greatness. Clodel's career lasted a little under 30 years. It was cut tragically short by her illness and internment. A large part of her career, a little over a decade, was spent in the studio of Auguste Rodin, that towering genius of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. What this all means is that Claudel's oeuvre is very small. There are 55 works by her in our exhibition, which account for the vast majority of her significant compositions. She was born on December 8, 1864, um, in a small town some 60 miles northeast of Paris. In 1876, the family moved to nogent sur seine about 60 miles southeast of Paris. It was in that town that Camille Claudel, still a teenager, modeled her first pieces. In a long article he wrote on the artist in 1898, the journalist Matthias Morhart described a family home turned into a studio by Claudel, where her brother, her sister, and the servants played the parts of models and assistants. And here you see one of her earliest works, um, Old Helen, which is a terracotta um, portrait of um, the maid in the family household. And uh, this is a sort of more finished version from 1885, but she actually began it much earlier than this, probably when she was 17 or 18. Um, and I think you can see already the prodigious talent of this young woman. Um, and what will become a lifelong interest for her in the expressive qualities of bodies, um, particularly um, her interest in old age. Now, in 1881, the family moves to Paris so she can study art. Claudel enrolled at the Academy Colorossi, one of the private schools that allowed women to receive an artistic education, which they were denied at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. Um, it was also at these private schools, such as the Colorossi, that women artists were actually able for the first time to study the nude body in an academic scenario, which was something that they had been traditionally denied. Um, later, Claudel also rented a studio in Paris, where she shared with other young women, um, which she shared with other young women, pooling the expenses of rent and models' fees. And this was an incredible group of young women. Um, they came from all over Europe and the UK, um, from Scandinavia, from London, um, and they all rented this, this little studio together and um, Rodin and other sculptors would come by once a week or once every two weeks and take a look at their work and sort of critique them, much the same as you get in art schools today at the end of a semester um, or something like that. Um, Another early work by Claudel, which was produced, um, begun probably around 1882, so right before she enters Rodin's studio. Um, this is Young Roman. Um, it is a pat painted or patinated plaster. I was extremely lucky to be able to acquire this um, for the Art Institute last year after a few years of searching for an important um, and unique work by the artist. It's not very easy. Um, I've already mentioned the fact that her oeuvre is extremely small. Um, the majority of her important compositions are now held by museums, mostly in France. Um, not so much in America, where even once we had purchased this work last week, there are still less than 10 works by Claudel in American museum collections. So when you compare that with the glut of Rodin's <laughs> um, at, at museums around America, it's, it's really quite extraordinary. Um, this early portrait is a depiction of her brother, Paul. Now, until recently, in France, if you said Claudel, it was automatically assumed that you were referring to Paul, her brother. Um, Paul went on to be one of the great French writers of the 20th century um, and also a very famous diplomat. For example, in the 1920s, he was the ambassador to um, Washington, D.C., from France. Um, 
Claudel and Paul were the two prodigies of their family, um, and they shared a certain creative spirit. Um, they were extremely close um, for the first couple of decades. Things went a little haywire after that. Um, what I love about this portrait is that she is conquering previous historical styles. Um, here she is taking on um, the austere frontality of um, Florentine sculpture from the mid 15th century by artists such as Donatello, um, works that she would have seen in reproduction or even at the Louvre in Paris. Um, what I love about the work as well is that she has painted it herself. Um, Claudel was very interested in color throughout her career. Um, and there are a few really interesting works like this that she's painted herself. Um, she's painted the work not to look naturalistic. Um, the hair is not one color, the skin another color, the clothing another color. She is applied all over the work um, in sort of mottled, um, translucent layers of color, um, such as reds, greens, but also yellows and shocking greens, almost radioactive in their effects. Um, and I think what she was trying to do here was to evoke or emulate the um, oxidized surfaces of ancient bronzes that have been dragged up from the ocean after hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, it's, it's an incredible work and shows just how wonderful she was as an artist, how daring she was as an artist, even before she entered Rodin's studio. Now, Claudel entered Rodin's studio, we think around 1882, um, perhaps as late as 1883, where her name first appears um, in, a, in, in one of Rodin's account books. Um, here is Rodin in the studio, working on the Burgers of Calais, um, uh, the sculptures that we have in, in these two gal galleries, and seated beside him, almost sort of <laughs> shoved off or cut off at, at the right, um, are the seating figures of Jesse Lipscomb, who was a fellow student of Claudel's in Rodin's studio, and on the far right, um, the young Camille Claudel. Um, and the significance of, of Claudel in relation to the Burgers of Calais, um, we'll, we'll discuss briefly in a minute. Um, here is an image of Rodin. It's quite typical of portrayal, portrayals of the artist. Here he is presented as a lone genius in the studio, the idiosyncratic mind from which boundless creative energy supposedly flowed. Um, in fact, his studio was huge and employed dozens of people at any given time. Here is one of the rare images on the left that actually shows Rodin in the studio with some semblance of his workers around him. Um, he is overseeing all this great, all this bustle of studio activity, telling people where to place things, how to commit, how to position them. Um, and and it, it was Rodin and the way that he operated his studio um, with people who, almost like a factory, um, were in charge of various parts in the production of a sculpture, um, from changing or, or casting his clay models into plaster um, and, and producing more and more plasters after those molds, um, through to the very carving of the marbles themselves. Um, in this way, Rodin sits at the, at the pinnacle um, of a much longer European tradition of um, workshop practices from the medieval period onwards, where you would have the master of the workshop who would be overseeing production by a number of um, other apprentices um, or paid workers. And in this case, um, you can see that the practice tradition, the practice continues today. Um, and, and here we have on the right, Jeff Koons in his studio, seated throne-like in the middle of all this activity, um, markedly doing nothing, um, <laughs> um, except sort of smiling and, and being present. Um, and there surrounding him are the, um, what's been called the blue ball and chain gang. Um, he, the members of his workshop who are um, physically doing all the artistic production. <laughs> um, now, 
the people, many famous sculptors went through Rodin's studio, um, mostly early in their career, um, as students and also as practitioners. Um, these included Claudel, Bordel, Brancusi. Um, it was a blessing and a curse for these artists. They certainly learned much from Rodin and gained contacts and patrons through him, but his stranglehold on sculptural production at that time exposed them to accusations of being too indebted to him stylistically. As Brancusi later noted, quote, nothing grows in the shadow of great trees. And of course, Brancusi left Rodin's studio fairly early on precisely for that reason. Um, Claudel's situation was particularly difficult given her unique situation as not only assistant and collaborator, but model and romantic partner. Claudel was not a simple laborer or compliant student under Rodin. During the decade she spent in his studio, um, she increasingly took on more and more important tasks. She became completely in indispensable to Rodin. As the journalist Morhart described, quote, he consults her on everything. On each decision to be taken, he deliberates with her, and it is only after having agreed that he decides definitively. But active participation in Rodin's studio necessarily reduced the time available for Claudel to create her own sculpture and fueled attacks on her work as derivative of the master. I love this quote describing Claudel in Rodin's studio in the 1880s, early 1890s. Um, Everyone who visited the studio remembers her. Silent and diligent, she remained seated in her little chair. She barely listens to the long chatter of idlers. Solely occupied with her work, she kneads in clay and models the foot or the hand of a figure placed in front of her. Sometimes she raises her head, she looks at the visitor with her big, clear eyes, whose light is so interrogative and so persistent. Then she immediately resumes her interrupted work. Now, it was ex an exciting time to be in Rodin's studio. This was the moment of Rodin's ascension. Um, he, during the 1880s, early 1890s, was working on many of his greatest compositions, the ones that would catapult him to public fame, including the Burgers of Calais, which by now are quite familiar to you, and then on the right, the, the, the great and ultimately unfinished um, Gates of Hell. Claudel was involved in the production of both of these compositions. Um, and we have a letter from her from the mid to late 1880s that she writes to um, a friend. And she must have been asked, you know, what work have you done lately? Um, what are you going to exhibit at the Salon this year in Paris? Um, you know, what new work will we get to see? And she said, unfortunately, I've been too busy to do any of my own work because I've been working so hard on Rodin's compositions. She said, I am in charge of modeling the hands and the feet. Now, this is a very, very suggestive um, observational sentence that, that she writes. And, you know, we can never be entirely sure um, precisely what she means or, or what, what stage of modeling a composition her involvement came in. Um, but I think we can probably um, we can probably come to some kind of vague conclusion that she was involved in a very serious way in, um, in, in some of these works, particularly these works that you see before you. Um, Claudel was an extraordinary modeler of hands, of feet, of eloquent bodies. And I think that is one of the reasons why Rodin valued her so much and why he precisely had her specifically working on hands and feet. Um, on the left, you see this extraordinary, it's only about this big, um, a little study of a hand that she produced in Rodin's studio. Um, on the right, you see a similar kind of study around the same size um, that Rodin made in the studio. Um, Rodin has, been come to know, come, has come to be known as an artist who um, was working constantly 
on little fragments of hands, heads, feet, all to serve um, as ideas for compositions later on, as little fragments that he would recombine, recombine over the years into completely new compositions. Um, and so it, 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 it seems completely understandable that Rodin, um, that Claudel would have been um, engaged in similar practices um, within Rodin's studio. Um, here, on the right, here on the next slide, you see um, a study of a left leg, which unfortunately, this is the best image I could get you from the Musée Rodin. Um, it's in the exhibition. It's actually incredibly beautiful, um, much more detailed than it looks here because the angle is not very good. Um, and then on the right, you see again a group of legs, um, leg studies, um, again, the same sort of size um, that Rodin made um, in the studio around the same time. Um, you know, and then to look, after looking at Claudel's hand studies, Rodin's hand studies, to then come to the Burgers of Calais, um, I think you can see um, the excitement in the shared vision of these two artists as he's working on this composition. Um, and then a work that I'll, I'll, I'll discuss later, um, her towering masterpiece, The Age of Maturity. And here you see as well Claudel using her knowledge and ability to model expressive hands um, put to very, very good use in the service of narrative and in the service of, um, of evoking emotion. Now, because Claudel and Rodin were working on very similar models at the same time, um, there has posthumously uh, been a lot of confusion surrounding the attribution of their works. Um, now, when, when Rodin died, um, everything in his studio that was there was left to the French state. Um, and they had then the ability to make posthumous casts in limited editions of the plasters that they found in his studio. One such plaster um, depicted the head of a laughing boy. Um, and you see a bronze version here. Um, and in the 1920s, um, Jules, Jules Massbaum, um, who was a great collector of Rodin in America and founded the Rodin Museum in Philadelphia, he commissioned uh, this specific bronze um, for his new Rodin Museum. And because the plaster that it was cast from was found in Rodin's studio after he died, um, the foundry, um, uh, Rudier, um, immediately stamped on the side of it the signature of Rodin. Um, and so until about 15 years ago, this work was always displayed in the, the Rodin Museum in Philadelphia as a work by Auguste Rodin. Um, now, about 15 years ago, the plaster you see on the left here was discovered. Um, and you can see that it's the same model as the bronze on the right. Now, if you turn that plaster around, on the back, scratched into the plaster, is Camille Claudel's signature. So, you know, we are still making discoveries like this. I suspect that there are many um, plasters remaining in Rodin's, um, in the Rodin Museum, um, both in Paris and Meudon, um, which, which could very possibly have been made by Claudel. Um, now, we often think that um, within a studio context, the influence between a teacher and a student flows in one direction, from top down. Um, Claudel and Rodin's relationship was very different. Um, and here is a prime example. On the left, you see um, Claudel's exquisite, exquisitely modeled um, terracotta, Young Girl with a Sheaf. It was probably modeled in Rodin's studio um, in, cl in clay from life, um, from a, a model posing in front of her. Um, I love this sort of, there's a sort of awkwardness to the placement of the legs and the, and the limbs and sort of sharp angles, and yet also something quite soft and Rococo-like um, about the entire composition. Um, so she produced that in 1887, and then the next year, Rodin had this marble made <laughs> on the right, and it was, he called it Galatea. Um, it is a wholesale lifting of Claudel's composition. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's, 
it would be easy to say, oh, Rodin stole the composition. You know, I think the, the studio practices uh, and, and what goes on within a studio is a lot more complex than that. Um, but I think that the most interesting point to make is that um, these are two sculptors who are, you know, feeding off each other um, artistically, watching each other work in the studio, getting excited by what the other person is doing. And I think the immense respect between the two artists um, is, is unmistakable when you look at something like this. Um, at the same time, Claudel made her great portrait of Rodin. Um, she would have modeled it in clay, and you have to imagine this, this coming together in the studio physically of Rodin sitting in front of Claudel as she's modeling at her modeling stand, hours they would have spent together while she was doing this. Can you imagine the crackling energy between these two gargantuan personalities as she's modeling his likeness? Um, and you can see here that um, she is really emphasizing um, his forehead, um, the supposed seat of creativity and genius, the strong nose, um, I love, in particular, the way in which she um, uses his beard um, to create a very sort of stable, rock-like base um, for the sculpture itself, a, a pedestal of sorts. Um, it's very, very interesting. And the composition as a whole always sort of reminds me of, of Rodin's thinker. Um, I will mention quickly that, you know, this became Rodin's... Um, calling card. Every time he had an exhibition, he would have this bust sent along to the exhibition. I think, you know, more as a calling card for him than for her, frankly. Um, but it was her most exhibited um, portrait uh, during her lifetime. And uh, coincidentally, the, one of the reasons why we did the Claudel show in Chicago was that in 1893, Claudel exhibited her work for the first time in this country at the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition. And she sent this work, um, which, was, um, which was shown in the official French pavilion. Um, you know, why she sent a portrait of Rodin, I'll never understand. Um, she, had, <laughs> she had plenty of other things she could have sent. Um, now, Rodin made many likenesses of Claudel at the same time, um, many more than she obviously made of him. Um, and this is perhaps the most mysterious, the most evocative of them. Um, the difference between their approaches to likeness was as follows. Claudel's bust is called Bust of Rodin. Um, it is absolutely a portrait of a person. Um, Whenever Rodin did a likeness of Claudel, they were never shown as portrait of Claudel or Camille Claudel. You know, he always turned her into an allegory or something else. Um, so here she is thought. In other works, she is war or France um, uh, or the convalescent. Um, and so she always, her own subjectivity and identity is always taken away from her, paradoxically, when he makes her likeness. Um, this work, which um, draws heavily, in a way, on um, both his and, and Claudel's interest in Michelangelo, um, and Michelangelo's idea that, you know, the, the sculptures, sculpted bodies were already waiting within a marble block, ready to, ready to be um, um, set free. Um, but there is real ambiguity here. I mean, is she sinking into the stone? Is she trapped in it? Or is she emerging from it? Um, we, have, we have some anecdotal evidence from Rodin's studio that the idea for him was one of thought animating matter. Um, so it would suggest that she's emerging from the stone, but I wonder what she would have thought um, when she saw this. Um, Being in Rodin's studio for so long, you know, 10 years, um, almost, you know, half of her entire career, um, Claudel began to suffer from um, uh, critical reactions to her work. Um, whenever a critic mentioned her in a newspaper, and she was mentioned very frequently, um, because she was always exhibiting at the Paris Salon and, and always created a stir. But critics like to begin every, every piece about her with, 
Mademoiselle Claudel, student of Rodin. <laughs> Mademoiselle Claudel, um, working in Rodin's studio. Um, you know, Mademoiselle Claudel, um, she needs to be careful. She, her work is too close to that of Rodin. You know, she's imitating Rodin. She's derivative of Rodin. You can only imagine what that must have felt like um, for this, with this artist, particularly this young woman artist um, in, in the eight, late 1880s and 1890s. Um, I find it really hard to understand, frankly, um, because I think their, um, their approaches can be uh, vastly different. And this is a perfect comparison, I think. Um, on the left is, um, on the right, I'll say, is Rodin's Crouching Woman, um, modeled from life. Um, in the studio at the beginning of the 1880s, Claudel would have been very aware um, of this composition. Um, in fact, and this is apocryphal, I would imagine, um, in the great Isabella Adiani movie, um, there's a scene where the, the naked model is on a turntable and Rodin sort of has her in a position which is vaguely similar to this. And Claudel sort of shoves him aside and, and walks up and places the model in precisely this. Um, this I, I doubt that happened, but you know, it's an interesting in terms of their ideas of their collaboration. We also know that Rodin gave her a bronze cast um, of this composition, um, which she sent in the 1890s to an exhibition in Brussels, I think. Um, and here on the left, um, modeled just a couple of years later in Rodin's studio from a live model, is Claudel's version of A Crouching Woman. It was probably the first independent work she made within his studio, and she's absolutely taking on um, Rodin's earlier work. How could she not? Um, now, you know, it, it, their sensibilities, it seems to me, are vastly different when you compare these two works. You know, Rodin's work um, is quite awkward in its presentation. Um, the figure is not um, completely naturalistic. Um, the figure is completely on display for the viewer, utterly objectified. Um, this is a hypersexualized piece with thighs splayed. Um, this woman is not engaging with the viewer. She is actively turning away so as not to challenge you. Um, and then here we have on the left, Claudel's much more naturalistic um, depiction of a, a crouching woman. Um, if, if you look, uh, if you walk around this object, you see every single vertebrae down the woman's back. Um, this is a fleshy woman. This, is a, this, this seems to resemble Claudel's you know, own awareness of the lived reality of the female body. Um, this is a body that has weight and gravity, um, you know, folds of flesh, age. Um, you know, and while she is covering herself as if she is aware of us, she is still looking out. Um, and so we still can engage with her. This is a woman that has a soul, <laughs> an identity, a personality. Um, and therein lies some of the great differences, I think, um, between Claudel and Rodin. Um, here is um, a, a version of Claudel's Crouching Woman that she created um, or, or, or altered the existing composition, probably in the early um, 20th century, by doing something utterly radical, by slicing off the head, um, the shoulders, um, the knees, and the thighs, in order to create a fragment. Um, and it makes a lot of sense. She had, she visited the Louvre often, and she would have seen broken marble fragments from antiquity. Um, there was one in particular of Venus at the Louvre that was quite famous at the time and entered the Louvre's collection in the 1880s. Um, and, you know, but I think she's also challenging, you know, our received notions of the wholeness um, or the integrity of the human body. Um, this is Brancusi before Brancusi. I mean, this is incredibly dar daring. Um, for, for the late 19th, early 20th centuries. Um, and it's a work that's not seen very often. There are only two casts in existence. Um, but thankfully, a few years ago, um, this particular cast was bought and entered um, the Gettys collection. 
Now I'm going to talk uh, quickly about um, the one work um, that uh, Clodell worked very hard on um, during her time in Rodin's studio. Um, and this was called Sakuntala. And you can see on the left here a photograph of Claudel um, modeling one of the figures in clay. You can see that it's life-size, even over life-size, actually. Um, and the work was exhibited in plaster um, at the Salon in 1888, and it was her first major success. Um, the plaster still exists, but it's damaged um, in, in a museum in, in regional France. Um, now, at the time, most sculptors would present plasters at the Paris Salon uh, because to produce something in, on speculation in marble or bronze was virtually impossible for a sculptor because those materials are too expensive. Um, so what you would do is you would present a work um, in plaster and hope that somebody would come along, whether it be a private patron or the French state, who would commission you to produce the composition in marble or bronze. Um, Claudel, and this is typical for her career, um, she asked the French government uh, to commission Sakuntala in uh, marble, and um, the government said no, um, even though it had been so successful and won her a medal at the Paris Salon. She had to wait um, 15 years or so before somebody finally commissioned her to produce um, the composition in marble. And here you see it here on the right. By this time, she's changed the title of the work from Sakuntala, which was a story based on an ancient Sanskrit play, um, to a story based on um, a poem by Ovid, Vatumnus and Pomona. Um, what the composition is, is the coming together of um, two lovers, the moment just as they are connecting, not fully connected, but in the process of connecting. Um, it is about the abandonment to love. Um, now, Camille Claudel carved her own marbles. It may come as a little bit of a shock to you um, to find out that Rodin never carved a marble <laughs> in his entire career. Um, every marble that you see by Rodin was carved by somebody that he contracted to carve the marble for him. Claudel was an extraordinary marble carver. She was very proud of it because it allowed her to separate herself or distinguish herself from Rodin. Um, there's a wonderful um, uh, newspaper article where somebody came to visit Claudel when she was working on her Vatumnus and Pomona. Um, and the first thing she's, she's got her, you know, her, her studio attire on, and the first thing she says to the journalist was, forgive the dust on my blouse, for it is I myself who carves the marble. <laughs> and I think she was desperate to get that into the newspaper articles, but people would have known exactly what she was talking about. Um, I think it's, it's, it's for sure that, um, that Claudel would have learned how to carve in Rodin's studio. Um, from other people, practitioners who were engaged by him. Um, and I think it's highly likely, um, if not almost certain, that she would have carved some of his marbles as well. Um, we don't have evidence in his account books. I'm not surprised that we don't. Um, but I think, that, I think that he would have been an absolute fool um, not to have used her exceptional ability in this regard. Um, I love the Vitamnus and Pomona because it tells you everything you need to know about what she was like as a marble carver. Um, she's a delicate carver. You see all these sort of little delicate marks on the surface and then this glorious satin sheen um, all over the figures. Um, as, as she neared its completion, she proudly declared that, my marble group is becoming marvelous. It's like mother of pearl. Um, the sculpture capitalized on an immediately comprehensible and universal theme. As I said, the submission to love. Um, now, some years later, Claudel's brother Paul wrote a fascinating essay on, on Claudel and her work. And he compared the Thomas and Pomona, Sacuntala, 
to Rodin's very famous The Kiss, carved by Rigo. <laughs> um, in the first, he said, referencing The Kiss, the man is, so to speak, seated to dine at the woman. <laughs> he sits down to enjoy her. He uses both hands, and she does her best, as they say in American English, to deliver the goods. <laughs> in my sister's group, he continues, he, um, the spiritual is everything. The man on his knees is pure desire. His face lifted, he embraces this marvelous being, this sacred flesh given to him from above before he even dares to seize it. It is impossible to see anything at the same time more passionate and more chaste. For me, the Vitumnus and Pomona seems much closer in some ways to Rodin's other very famous composition, Eternal Idol. Um, and I thought of this when reading an undated letter to Claudel um, written by Rodin in which he expresses at length his powerful and confused feelings for the woman. And he exclaims, my dear one, I am on my knees facing your beautiful body, which I embrace. Now, it's hard not to think of both the sculptor's compositions when reading this. Now, I'm starting to run out of time. So what I want to mention is that this sort of marks the end of Claudel's um, time in Rodin's studio. Um, she became increasingly um, frustrated by the way that critics were treating her, and she came to believe that Rodin and his gang um, were actively you know, trying to undermine her um, publicly and prevent her from gaining commissions. In some cases, I think she was absolutely right, um, but a, there is a sort of paranoia that really developed and became worse and worse and worse over the next couple of decades. Um, and she went on um, to leave Rodin's studio in 1893. She starts producing the most extraordinary things, um, such as The Waltz, a work of which nobody had ever seen anything like this, a work that's threatening to spin off into the sky. Um, in our catalog for the exhibition, the contemporary artist Kiki Smith wrote so beautifully about this work, and she said that in the waltz, the two lovers um, are like leaves of seaweed anchored underwater, moving to and from each other. And it's just one of the most beautiful ways, I think, of describing it. Um, you know, she also starts making these extraordinary miniaturized pieces um, in plaster, in bronze, in onyx marble. <laughs> it is the most difficult um, uh, material to carve in. It would break constantly as she was working in it and she had to repair it as she was making it. Um, you know, all these works that are investigating in many ways the interior lives of women um, in a way that no other sculptor was doing at the time. Um, now, around 1905, her mental health starts to take a real dip. Um, the writer Maurice Potager wrote, I saw Mademoiselle Claudel yesterday. She's exhausted to the point of despair. She wants to abandon her art, and she's already broken some of her molds. Her stormy and somewhat bizarre nature certainly explains in part the solitude, abandon, and near financial distress to which she has been reduced after having known all the promises of great success. Um, she herself bore witness to her difficulties. In a letter to her dealer, Eugène Blow, she wrote, it has become clear to me that I am the plague, the cholera of generous and benevolent men who deal with matters of art. And if I were to be seen coming with my plasters, the emperor of the Sahara himself would immediately flee. This miserable art is better suited for ugly dupes and those with long beards than for a woman relatively endowed, well endowed, by nature. Forgive these bitter and belated reflections. They will not appease those hideous monsters who have set me on this dangerous path. Um, soon after, um, her brother wrote a letter uh, from Paris saying, in Paris, Camille mad. 
wallpaper torn away in long strips, a single broken and torn armchair, horribly dirty. She is enormous, her face dirty, talking incessantly in a monotonous, metallic voice. During this time, she destroyed a huge number of her artworks. Um, and, you know, um, and then in 1913, Days after her father's death, he was her last supporter. Um, her mother and her brother forcibly interred her, interned her um, in a psychiatric institution, having displayed symptoms of what was then called paranoid psychosis. She remained confined for the, the final 30 years of her life, despite doctors informing her family that she could be released or at least moved closer to the family. Tragically, she never sculpted again. Um, on September 3rd, 1932, her loyal supporter and dealer, Eugène Bleu, wrote a long and very moving letter to her. In the scheming word of, world of sculpture, he wrote, Rodin, you, and perhaps three or four others introduced a sense of authenticity, and that has not been forgotten. What a genius, that word is not strong enough. How could you deprive the world of so much beauty? One day when Rodin was visiting me, I saw him suddenly freeze before one of your works, contemplate it, softly caress the metal, and weep. Yes, weep like a child. Now he has been dead for 15 years. In truth, he only ever loved you, Camille, and I can say it now. Oh, I know well, Camille, that he abandoned you. I will not try to justify him. You suffered so much because of him, but I take nothing back from what I just wrote. Time will heal everything. What can I do for you now, dear Camille? Write to me. Take the hand I'm reaching out to you. I've never ceased to be your friend. Now, denied outside correspondence, Camille never received the letter. Um, her thoroughly modern sculptures, however, continue to strike at our hearts as they contend with universal themes of love, loss, passion, and the intimacy of commonplace experience. They embody her uncompromising pursuit of stylistic and professional independence and continue to resonate today. I hope that you will fall in love with her daring sculptures, just as I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emerson. Emerson has kindly agreed to take a couple of questions. We have about five minutes. Uh, if anyone has a question, we have a microphone. Haley has got the microphone. If anyone has questions for Dr. Bowyer. It's gotta be one. <laughs> you answered it all. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't. I feel, t I feel bad because I wanted to focus on her, her, her time with Rodin because you have these wonderful Rodins here. So we didn't really, I uh, didn't have a chance to really get into the extraordinary creations that she made um, after she leaves Rodin's studio. But um, hopefully if you can't get to Chicago in the next couple of weeks, maybe you'll get to the Getty um, uh, beginning, at the beginning of April. Um, and or indeed after that, if you're in Paris, um, you'll be able to see a number of her works at the Musée Rodin, the Musée d'Orsay, and the new Musée Camille Claudel. Do you have a question over here? Sure. Um, what is the process of sculpting? So you mentioned that you may be <laughs> clay, there's plaster, you could go to marble. So what is the, the process or what did... Uh, it's a long, convoluted process in, 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 depending on you know, where you want, to, what medium you want to end up in. Um, and it can be a little difficult to explain, um, but you know, you would, uh, most sculptors would begin by modeling in, in damp clay, and they would get their composition, um, they, would, they would sort of finish it, um, it would be then um, either fired into terracotta in a kiln, or a plaster would be taken from the still somewhat damp um, or, or recently dried clay. Um, so a mold would be taken in plaster and from that negative, a positive plaster sculpture would be produced. Um, then you can do a number of different things. You, um, what would often happen is um, various measuring apparatuses would be used in order to, um, to proportionally enlarge um, your smaller work into a larger size. 
um, in clay, again, probably. Um, and then again, you would make another plaster. Um, and from that plaster, um, you, can, you can create a mold that could then be used um, to produce a bronze. Or um, you can use your positive plaster as um, a model from which to, again, using measuring tools, transfer the composition into um, the carving of a block of stone. Um, in particular, the, the both, you know, both the, the bronze casting and marble carving techniques are very complicated. Um, marble carving in particular, um, because of the, the, the very close scrutiny, you constantly have to pay to measuring the distances because marble is a subtractive process. So, you know, you, you never want to carve too much because you can't get it back again. Um, so, in a nutshell. <laughs> We've got a question oh, okay, back yeah. here and then I'll, I'll okay, come sure. to you next. Okay, you mentioned the difficulty of finding pieces by uh, Caldell. So, which one is your most prized? And there, there was one that you said it was difficult to find. Where did you find it? Um, well, the, the, the work that we found for the museum was previously unknown, and that was really exciting because we thought we knew where all of the significant works by Claudel were. There are two existing catalog resumes of her production, um, and, you know, there are a number of bronzes that still come up on the market, um, and, and because many of her bronzes were cast in editions, of anything from two through to 50. Um, so those you sort of see around, but a plaster, they're much more rare. And um, the one that we purchased um, suddenly emerged in the attic of a French family house um, in, in, in the uh, outside of Paris um, after having been in the family um, since they acquired it in around the 1930s, I think. Um, and they acquired it from Eugène Blow, her dealer, who had it in his collection um, until then. I ran around to the front. <laughs> there you go. Yes, uh, has um, her case been reviewed by contemporary psychiatrists? Oh, there's a whole industry in, um, <laughs> in posthumously diagnosing Claudel, yes. Um, and I personally, um, it, it's a practice that worries me a little bit and, and um, because to, to diagnose someone posthumously when they can't have actually sat in front of you, you know, it seems to me, um, I don't know how useful it is necessarily, um, but in terms of her mental health, she absolutely had problems. Um, and, but they, they appear to have become manageable after a few years. Um, and it's extraordinary to think that if she had had access to the kind of medications we have today, um, that, that none of that would have happened to her and she probably would have continued sculpting unabated and, um, and would have been able to, you know, would have been in that exciting moment when Picasso was starting to sculpt, when, you know, all these, all this next generation of artists and she was always looking for the new and the extraordinary, and, and I think that she would have been so thoroughly interested um, by, you know, the, the, the next generation of artists that came after Rodin. We have time for one more? Yeah, okay. One yeah. more. Um, it, did they ever um, record how many months, years, the creations, were done in? We, we, we sort of know because sometimes we, in, in letters and documents, or um, we'll, we'll hear her talking about a composition in a letter. And, um, and, and this work here, for example, um, in 1893, she writes to her brother and she scribbles a quick sketch of an idea that is three, three women gossiping. Um, and she'd seen this scene um, uh, in an omnibus or in a, in a train carriage um, and she said, I'm going to do this. And she tells her brother um, that she's really excited to do it and she says, see, it's nothing like Rodin. And the fact that she even felt that she had to say that is extraordinary, but indeed it is nothing like Rodin. But so we have a, 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 
from her correspondence, we have an, a beginning point for her thinking about the composition. Um, and then we have end point, because this was shown at the Paris Salon in 1897. So we know sort of when she started thinking about it and when she completed it, because you would always sort of show almost immediately at the Salon when she finished her work. And so she did her own sculptures without a team, uh, or did she almost, have? Almost completely. Um, she would sometimes contract out for somebody to either enlarge one of her models um, for her. Um, toward the end, she asked, um, she was physically frail and, and um, she was able to get one of Rodin's practitioners who went on to become a sculptor in his own right, um, Pompon. Um, he carved a couple of her smaller works for her that she paid him to do. Um, but the most significant works, she did it herself. One more. <laughs> Could you recommend a book of one of your favorites that has been written? That has been written. Well, I... That, that has been written about her. Well, I, I mean, am, I, I know there's so many, hugely, but is there... I, I'm very happy to suggest the exhibition catalog. <laughs> 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 um, which has a wonderful biography and then chapters on each of the major works. Um, and uh, there is also um, a book called Camille Claudel. I can't remember the exact title. Um, uh, that was written by Claudel's grandniece in the 80s and early, or early 90s. Um, and that's a, that's a great source of, you know, and it's, um, it comes across almost like a novel. Um, and again, the, you know, the Isabella Adjani movie is just something else. <laughs> well worth seeing. <laughs> Thank you again, Thank you Emerson. very much. <laughs>